Hey guys, thank you for joining us. We are about to watch a live streamed conversation between Tulsi Gabbard, Dennis Kucinich and Stephen Kinzer on the very timely and important topic of Iran. Now, as you know, we had a near miss. Last week, we easily could have ended up in another wasteful war in the Middle East. Tulsi has been warning us and warning us about not just this dangerous administration, but the entire industry of war that is currently embedded into our politics. These wars are ridiculous. We've gained nothing, and yet we continue to make the same mistake over and over again. What did we get out of invading Iraq? We now have a nation that's friendlier to Iran than us, and they've asked us to leave. What did we get out of going to war in Afghanistan? We've been there for nearly 20 years. We've been unable to defeat a militia and are having to surrender and come to a peace agreement with the Taliban. What makes us think that a war with Iran would end any differently? We haven't won a war since World War II, and interestingly, that is precisely the time when the military-industrial complex began to rise. Yet after all of our invasions and the thousands of American lives lost, our government still tries to convince us that another invasion is needed for you and I to be safe. Really? It's nonsense, and its only intent is to make a bunch of rich weapons manufacturers and banks even richer. I'm hoping that after this recent scare, Americans are starting to wake up. I'm hoping they realize that what Tulsi has been warning us about over and over again is the most pressing topic we Americans face today. Many of us care about a lot of domestic issues, health care, education, environment. But until the powers that be shift their focus away from wasteful wars and turn towards us, the people, we will just be chipping away at an iceberg. We'll make small progress, but never any big change, never anything that really betters our lives, so as long as we are committed to ending the lives of others. It has to stop. It's our number one most pressing issue. It is life and death. We have become a nation that ruins lives, all in the name of being mighty and powerful. We need a new kind of might in the White House, one that leads with love and looks for a more peaceful future at home and abroad. Though the recent events were very scary, my hope is they woke people up to the reality of where we are as a nation and the fact that we need Tulsi Gabbard to help steer us in the right direction. So thank you for joining us on this live stream, whether you're watching from my channel or from Tulsi's, this is so important, the most important issue of our time. And the fact that on very short notice, when we first had this idea to have this conversation tonight at such a timely moment, all three of them immediately said yes and did what they had to do uh, to be able to be here and to help lead this discussion and bring each of their unique backgrounds and experiences from the past, the present, so that we can make sure that we work together towards a better future. Uh, I wanna just kick off the conversation tonight um, really from a very personal place. Uh, I get asked very frequently how I came to be here, how I came to not only serve in the way that I am, but to run for president, to make foreign policy and the cost of war such a central issue uh, in my campaign. Make a central issue that is my focus. For me, growing up in Hawaii, fourth of five kids, uh, blissfully, naive to the world around me, surfing, hiking, growing up in a really beautiful place, filled with this spirit of aloha, and not knowing exactly what path my life would take for myself, uh, but realizing and experiencing from a young age um, that I was happiest when I was living my life in a way that was pleasing to God, uh, in a way that was uh, allowing me to be able to work for the well-being of others, and in protection of our planet. And that has been and continues to be my guiding motivation and the decisions that I make in my life, uh, including the decision that I made after the attacks on 9-11. It was uh, a day like for so many that completely changed my life, had an incredible impact on me and opened my eyes up very quickly to the world outside of the one that I had grown up in. And I knew then that Somehow, some way, I wanted to dedicate my life in the service of um, working to protect the safety and security and freedom uh, of the American people, of our country. Uh, eventually, that led me to enlist in the military, again, like so many Americans, 
Uh, and it led me to the point when, as I was 22 years old, um, newly enlisted private in the Army National Guard, uh, this was in 2003 when President Bush and so many leaders in Congress uh, told all of us, told the American people that we had to go to war in Iraq, that we had to go and overthrow Saddam Hussein because he posed a threat to the security of our country, to the American people, that he was somehow tied with Al-Qaeda, that uh, he had weapons of mass destruction that he may potentially give to Al-Qaeda, ever escalating this threat that really began very clearly on that attack on 9-11. So I had faith that our leaders would not lie to us. I would even say I had unquestioning faith. I had no reason to be skeptical. And I believed what they told us. So when our brigade combat team in Hawaii was activated to go and deploy to Iraq uh, during the height of the war, I was not on the mandatory deployment roster. I was serving as a state representative in Hawaii, but I knew that I had to go. I had to go to make sure that I had the backs of my brothers and sisters in uniform, left my reelection campaign, volunteered to deploy, and deployed in a medical unit where every single day in an excruciating way, I was confronted with the very real, terribly high human cost of war, of who really pays the price for war. In my brothers and sisters in uniform, every single day, the very first thing that I did was I went through a list, name by name, of every single American casualty and injury that had occurred the day before, in the previous 24 hours. Every single day, seeing those names and thinking of them, thinking of their loved ones, their children, their family members back home who are filled with stress and anxiety, worried for the well-being of their loved ones. Seeing firsthand the cost of war that the civilians, the people of Iraq paid because of this war that our nation's leaders had declared on them. I gained an, uh, such an incredible understanding and really grew so much over the years. I ended up going on a second deployment to Kuwait, serving in Congress now for seven years, really focused on national security, on foreign policy. I've served on the Foreign Affairs Committee, on the Armed Services Committee, uh, on the Homeland Security Committee, really understanding the implications of the decisions both that Congress does and does not make and the decisions that the President and Commander-in-Chief makes. I think this really leads us to this moment of us gathering here tonight and the challenge that we face in this country where as we talk about the cost of war, it is paid for in lives and in treasure, our, America, our taxpayer dollars, and in our country's national security. But it is impossible at this point to begin to measure that cost because these wars are still going on. We're still at war with Iraq. This administration is invoking the 2002 authorization to use military force against Iraq to wage war against Iran. We are still at war in Syria. We still have troops in Syria. We're still at war in Afghanistan. And now we are opening up a whole new chapter of yet another wasteful, unnecessary war. So I, I appreciate all of you coming here and joining us tonight because these decisions have an impact on every single one of us, every single one of us in this country uh, and in the world. I wanna thank everyone who is joining the live stream at home who couldn't be here tonight and who are participating in this conversation. Uh, and thank you again to my colleagues here on the stage and I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we have. Mahalo. <laughs> Okay, so Stephen, I'd like to start with you um, to help set the stage a little bit about how we got here, in particular, the questions around regime change in Iran um, and the particular position that we find or that the Americans have created with the Sunni and the Shia in Iran to help us build a context for what this struggle is going to be about in two minutes. <laughs> Before this 
realities of evolution were understood, there were various theories about how life came to exist on Earth. The ancient Greeks developed a theory which was called spontaneous generation. It meant that if you had kind of a pile of mud and there was water and there was sun, suddenly somehow animals would just jump out of it and that's how life began. Sometimes I think Americans look at the world that way. We look at world crises that way. They're not caused by anything. They just suddenly pop up in a fertile environment where we know people are given to upheaval and conflict. We, we, we never ask why these things happen. Iran is a perfect example. I truly believe Iran is the most misunderstood country in the world, certainly by Americans. Uh, we look at Iran and we wonder, why is it that Iran never managed to develop a democracy and progress out of the kind of politics they've had for so many years? Well, there's an answer to that. Um, Iran first developed a constitution more than 100 years ago. There are countries in the Middle East that even to this day do not have a constitution. Iran has been having political parties and elections and parliaments ever since then. The elections haven't always been fair and free. The Constitution hasn't always been followed, unlike here. Uh, but politics is something that Iranians very much understand. In the period uh, after the Second World War, when the old dictator Reza Shah was gone, democracy suddenly exploded. The promise of the 1906 Constitutional Revolution was fulfilled. Iran became a democracy. They had free elections in the late 40s and early 50s and produced a leader who embodied what Iranians wanted. That was Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh. So his program essentially had two pieces. Uh, one was democracy, the other was nationalism. Democracy meant the elected leaders, the parliament and the prime minister should rule, not the Shah. And nationalism meant Iran should be able to control its own resources, which in the case of Iran means oil. So with the unanimous vote of the Iranian parliament, uh, Mossadegh led the drive and nationalized Iran's oil industry. That set the outside world into a panic. Uh, the oil had been completely owned by a British company that was in turn mainly owned by the British government. The US government was also intimately involved, as were large American corporations. The idea of a Middle Eastern country nationalizing its resources and keeping the profits for itself rather than sending them to another country was something the outside world felt completely intolerable. And in the summer of 1953, the United States sent a CIA team to Iran. The mission was destroy this incipient democracy and replace it with a dictatorial regime that will give us the oil we want. That was accomplished in the space of just a few weeks in the summer of 1953. The Mossadegh regime was destroyed and more importantly, the prospects of for democracy in Iran were destroyed. We brought the Shah back and placed him on his peacock throne. The Shah ruled with increasing repression for 25 years. That repression produced the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. That's the revolution that brought into power this group that we are now confronting. That Islamic Revolution also had tremendous other effects. Um, it attracted the attention of Saddam Hussein, Iran's great enemy next door in Iraq. We decided to side with Saddam in a war against Iran. That turned out to be the longest war of the 20th century, the Iran-Iraq war. And it was the beginning of our death embrace with Saddam. That's where it came from. The Islamic revolution also terrified the Soviets. They were afraid Islamic radicalism would penetrate through their southern republics. That led them to send troops to Afghanistan, which brought us into Afghanistan, into the quagmire we are still in. So those few weeks in the summer of 1953 with a few CIA agents in Tehran produced a lot of history that we're still living through. If we had not done that, if we had allowed Iran's politics to develop as the way Iranians wanted, we might have had a thriving democracy in the heart of the Muslim Middle East all these 70 years. And I can hardly wrap my mind around how different 
the Middle East and the world might look had that been the case. The important thing about this is not only what it says about Iran, but what it says about the unintended results of American intervention in foreign countries. When you crash violently into the affairs of another nation, you're doing something like releasing a wheel at the top of a hill. You can let it go. You have absolutely no control over how it's going to bounce and where it's going to end up. That's what leads you to terrible self-inflicted crises like the one we're now confronting with Iran. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So what's always struck me as terrifying is how much of it is intentional and how much of it is just accidental. Um, I mean, it's clear that, as Andrew Bacevich would put it, we've been waging a war for the greater Middle East to secure oil for a long time. And, and one question that I'm still not clear from what you said is, is, I mean, I get how there's a direct military intervention or a direct intervention by the executive. But to what extent do you think this policy is something that was understood and embraced even in the 1950s by Congress? I think if we could get uh, President Eisenhower back here today and John Foster Dulles back here, they might have a good excuse, which would be, this was the very beginning of CIA overthrows of foreign government. We didn't have experience. Now we look back and we see it really didn't work out the way we hoped. We don't have that excuse today. Now we see what it leads to. So I think there are two kinds of consequences. One is the unintended consequences that we never thought of. Americans don't care about those because we've been fed this idea that we're so powerful, it doesn't matter what happens. Whatever happens, we'll be able to control it. History has proven that uh, that's not true. And then I think when we get up to the invasion of Iraq, I remember that so vividly myself, all the bad things that have come out of our invasion of Iraq were predicted. People were saying all of this was going to happen. Nobody can get up and say these were unpredicted consequences. They were consequences that you might have wished to ignore because you weren't listening to people who were talking outside of your own box. But nothing, no side effect, no terrible long-term effect, including the creation of ISIS, that came out of our invasion of Iraq was unpredicted. It's just that we didn't listen to the people who were saying something that we didn't want to hear. And I think this is a, a classic American problem. The, there's no limit in Washington to how many times you can be wrong <laughs> before you are finally judged not qualified to be a commentator on television or a deputy assistant secretary or something. And the opposite is actually true. Those that are right never get a chance to come in and participate in the decisions of power. So, uh, Dennis, you were there. So you were, you were a congressman. Yeah, speaking of which. You were a congressman between 1997 and 2013. That's when you, that's when you Correct. left. Um, and so you were fighting the good fight against the fight, which turned out not to be a good fight that America has been waging for these past 20 years. When you look back and you remember what happened and you see how we are interpreting it now, for example, the AUMF, which authorized force against Afghanistan, then turned to Iraq and now is being used in Iran, what would your colleagues have said? What would they, how would they interpret us today if they could see the continuation of this war and what it has produced. First of all, I am so uh, pleased to be here on behalf of Tulsi Gabbard, and I want to acknowledge the presence in the audience of my wife, who's joined uh, me in Tulsi. Hi, Elizabeth. Um, and uh, my connection with Tulsi goes back to uh, even prior to her becoming a member of Congress. The minute I met her in Washington, I said, this woman needs to be part of the national leadership of this country. And to, see, to be with you now on a platform in this all-important all state of New Hampshire, uh, to me, it, it's, it's an unfolding of the possibilities which exist when you work with people of courage and tenacity and, and, uh, and, and wisdom. So thank you, Tulsi, for the invitation. And uh, to Larry Les Lessig and Stephen Kinzer, thank you uh, for uh, the own, your own path that you've followed to, to this moment, to be at this stage. I mean, listening to Stephen a moment ago, 
where he's talking about spontaneous generation and uh, you, could, you know the so-called Big Bang theory, right? That things just boom. Well, you know when you when you go from evolutionary biology into militarism, the Big Bang theory means something else, doesn't it? And that's kind of what we were concerned about a week ago. Um, we're in a climate right now, which is what uh, Gore Vidal foretold when he wrote The United States of Amnesia. <laughs> Things just happen de novo here. They just spring from God knows where. And, and if, if I could put my finger on a single fault which exists in, um, in, in what has yet to be described as American political philosophy, it's the inability to get the causal connections, to see the, the connections between cause and effect. And, and even children, it's one of the first things we teach children. You do this and this is gonna happen. But the rather infantile response we've seen from the leaders of our government, this magical thinking that you can assassinate a foreign leader and there's Make up the reasons as you go along why you did it. It, it reflects not just the, the frailty and fault of uh, the individuals who the individual currently occupies that office in Washington. This is a structural problem. This is a fundamental challenge to what we stand for as a people as we attempt to describe what a democracy is. The fact that we have this Orwellian unfolding of events where people will say, well, we killed them out of self-defense. What? But this is not a new narrative. Going back to Larry's point, on October the 2nd, 2002, I distributed an analysis to hundreds of members of Congress pointing out that there's no proof that Iraq was connected to 9-11, even though George Bush's administration did everything they could to conflate Iraq with 9-11, that there was no proof that Iraq had the capability of attacking the United States. Their military budget was about 1% of the United States. I Iraq uh, did not in any way reflect as being a threat to the United States. And I, and I categorically parsed and analyzed and refuted every claim that was being made for war and distributed it to members of Congress. The f climate of fear, which encased the United States like a shroud, was so present during that, that vote. And even though Congress, many of congressmen knew better, and certainly the constituencies knew better because many of us were in demonstrations across the country. I was, on, I was in New York City and there were over a million people at a demonstration in New York City saying don't go to war. Well, we went to war anyway with, as Stephen points out, the calamitous effect. So what do we do now? Here we are. Um, <clears throat> We really, we really need to have some structural changes. And, and I think where we begin, this is just my opinion, um, we have to come home. We, we have about 800 bases in 70 countries. We have to end this madness as assuming that America has uh, the right and the obligation to rule the world. That is a fantasy and it needs to be dispensed with because what's happening is it is causing uh, a, a diminution of our ability to be able to meet the practical aspirations of the American people for, for, for health care, for education, for, for good paying jobs, for uh, a clean environment, all those things that have been part of what we once referred to as the American dream are being sacrificed to this uh, notion that, that somehow we have the obligation to, to rule the world. And, and behind that, as was behind uh, certainly the war in Iraq, is the big lie. The big lie, the, the idea that, uh, that we have the resources, the ability, the imperative to, to rule the world.
Years ago, I was a copy boy at the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and, and my first job there was to um, uh, go to homes of, of, of soldiers who gave their lives in Vietnam. And, you know, I'd, I'd drive up, and the home was um, like a clapboard home. It was almost always a, a Warren house, and a, you know, with the door flapping in the breeze, and the frayed curtains, and a... Uh, you, uh, you knock on a door, people lead you in, and the carpet's frayed, and everything looks like it's it's in a state of dis not disrepair, but but aging. And you see the the young man's more often in that picture on on a, atop the television, and a picture of Kennedy, and a picture of, of 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 the Pope or Christ on on the other side of the wall. And and I saw this, and I went and picked up these pictures, and it was like a litany over and over and over of people who who love the fact that their son was serving, who believe in the country. My, I, have a, I come from a family of people who served in the military. And, and yet, this faith, this belief in America is just getting trashed by people who think of some kind of a game of nations that you can just, you know, do whatever you want, zap anybody you want, bomb any country you want, kill anyone you want, and then, you know, do it in the name of heaven, you can justify it in the end. We need a fundamental change. And one of the reasons why I think Tulsi Gabbard's candidacy is so important is because she's raising those kind of questions. And, and finally, for, for my part at this moment, let me give you an example of how pernicious this drive towards war and militarization is. On December 11th, 2019, just a little more than a month ago, Congress had a vote on the National Defense Authorization Act. And that bill put close to $800 billion into this military machine, $800 billion. And that bill also created another branch of the military called the Space Force. Now, wouldn't you know it, there were 189 Republicans who voted for that bill, but there were 189 Democrats. Tulsi was only one of 41 Democrats who voted against that bill. And in the Senate, there were only five Democrats who voted against the bill. So this whole idea about you change parties, put another party in power, that we're going to automatically have a different approach, that's not necessarily so. And it's the structure. The present president promised an end to these wars. And the president who preceded him promised that as well. We're not going to be like a, an old horse led by a carrot, and we think the carrot called peace, somehow we're someday going to get it. We have to stop that thinking. We have to have the willingness to back an individual who's been on that path already of service, who has seen the effect of war, and knows that we must end it now. And this is the election to do it. So thank you. That's so profound, there's not much left to say, but let me just add one other thought, because uh, Congressman Kucinich was trying to tie these issues we're talking about into the presidential campaign and the race that we're talking about today. And let me add another uh, connection. Uh, several of the candidates uh, in this presidential uh, campaign, including Congresswoman Gabbard, are promoting great structural changes inside the United States. We're looking for ways to give people the basic rights that people in every other developed country have for health care, education, housing. We need infrastructure. Uh, those, uh, it, those projects require huge infusions of money. The place where that money is going to come from is by reducing the 800 military bases we have around the world and the hundreds of billions of dollars that we put into the military. But there's another connection. So it's a, it's a cliche to say that People don't cast votes according to foreign policy issues. Uh, I saw a story the other day saying that for many voters, foreign policy isn't even in the top 10, which sent me weeping out of the room. And, but it solidified my view that I'm going to be the defiant one, uh, as sort of the role God assigned me, and I'm going to vote only on foreign policy. And I'll tell you this, all those programs that many of the progressive candidates want 
realistically speaking, are never going to get through Congress. They're not going to materialize. You'll get something, but Congress is going to block 90% of the good social programs that any progressive leader is going to try to impose. But in foreign policy, a president can really make a change. A president can really reorient this country, as we've seen already with the clumsy efforts of our president. Look what the mess he has gotten us into. Look where he's brought us. I'm telling you, foreign policy is the place where a president can make a dramatic difference in a way that no president will ever be able to do in the next four years in domestic policy. So I hope that leads some people to think that if we really want to change this country, there's one way it can be done simply by electing a new president. And that means changing completely the way America faces the rest of the world. And that would be one of the most profound changes that we could possibly make to bring us back to being the country that we once dreamed we wanted to be. Thank, thank you, Stephen. And uh, one, one footnote to this discussion, which bears thinking about, not only with respect to the presidential race, but congressional races as well. <laughs> you know, during my time in Congress, I would meet so many of my colleagues who would say, well, yeah, I oppose that war. I oppose that war, oppose that war. And then they vote to fund it. Now, if you, as a consumer, if you oppose something, you don't buy it. But in Congress, people say they oppose wars, and then they vote for them. And let me tell you the, the constitutional significance of this. We're going to get a little bit into the discussion about Congress's role constitutionally. But having had the opportunity to sue, I think, at least three presidents related to um, uh, the, the use of force. Uh, I've been involved in court cases where federal courts decided that Congress's ultimate power is the power of the purse. And if Congress, if a president wages a war, and Congress, uh, Congress can cut off funds. But as long as Congress provides the money, yet we, we all have an obligation here to challenge those members of Congress who tell us, oh, I'm against that war, and then they fund it. So Tulsi, help us understand this. Um, you know, we used to have many peace-loving Democrats and peace-loving Republicans who would resist the push to war and had a principled basis for saying that America's job was not to make the world safe for democracy. America's job is to take care of America. And they all, on both parties, they practically disappeared. You're one of the very few in the Democratic Party who stands up, I mean, obviously, Congressman, you were as well, but one of the few who stands up and fights this. What really explains why we have no basis for peace in the political movements of America that can resist this fight that manifests itself so unanimously inside of Congress? You know, it's sad that we are in a place where standing for peace requires courage. That I think you mentioned, Dennis, uh, as that vote was about to take place, there was just an air of fear in the air. That people were concerned about, well, if I don't do this, how will I be criticized, or political ramifications, or one thing or the other. And I think it's even gotten worse, uh, exponentially so today. Uh, so I would point to, look, there's an incredible amount of influence that the foreign policy establishment and the military industrial complex has in Washington that as has been pointed out, crosses over both parties. No matter which way the political winds blow, left or right, left or right, that we don't see a real change in the positions of leaders in Washington. Uh, I think because there's a lot of money involved. When you look at the amounts of contributions being made to members on the Armed Services Committee in particular, coming from big defense contractors, you see how large that number is, and you start to think about, well, how does that figure into those decisions that they're making? What, what lobbyists are giving them phone calls before they take a really critical and important vote? Uh, Washington is very much, unfortunately, like high school. It's about popularity. It's about who's cool, who gets invited to the nice parties. If you're not on the guest list, you better watch out. 
you've become one of the uncool kids at high school. You've got all the different cliques, and they all, uh, in Hawaii, we call it talk stink. You talk stink about each other. If, if you are one of those who dares to challenge the, this establishment groupthink view that has been perpetuating these regime change wars and these follow on nation building missions without ever thinking or asking the most basic question, which is how does this serve the interests of our country? Is it making our country more safe or not? If we ask these basic questions time and time and time again, as we've seen thousands of American lives lost, tens of thousands more of our men and women coming home injured, millions of lives of people across the Middle East who have been killed as a result of these wars, the trillions of our taxpayer dollars being spent, and yet no one is asking the question, after all of this, are we more safe? Are we in a better place as a country? Is the quality of life of the American people across the country in a superior place? The answer to all of these questions is no, which a normal, rational thinking person would then say, okay, well, perhaps we should change. But you see this culture of fear that exists because uh, Congressman Kucinich had it when he stood up and was one of those lone voices for peace, questioning the group think and this presentation of lies to justify going to war with Iraq. He was criticized, he was called names. I've experienced the same thing in calling out and asking for evidence before the commander in chief goes and takes military action in another country. Oh, Tulsi's against regime change wars. That means she loves dictators. That means she supports this and she supports their actions. How dare she ask for evidence before the US military takes action? And in Washington, people don't wanna be called names. They don't wanna be unpopular. They don't wanna be picked out from the crowd, which is really a terrible, terrible thing when that is the measure for making decisions rather than understanding that this is life and death. This is life and death that we're talking about. Utter and total destruction for people in other countries in the world who are literally simply trying to survive, whose goal in life is the same as ours, to have a safe place to raise your kids, be able to put food on the table, to be able to provide better opportunities for them than you have for yourself. And I think this even ties into the decisions that President Trump has made. And if you look back to that first, what was it, 59 Tomahawk missiles he fired into Syria without evidence, without congressional authorization, without abiding by the Constitution that requires him to go to Congress and get that authorization before taking action, and what was the response that he got from the media? So many. This is the first time Donald Trump has actually acted like a president. It was Brian Williams saying, look at those beautiful missiles flying across the sky. Leaders from both parties in Congress applauding Donald Trump for taking an illegal, unconstitutional military action against a foreign country without presenting evidence to justify it, without justifying how that action serves our country's national security interests. So when you see a person like President Donald Trump being applauded for doing such a thing, you think he'll be more or less likely to do it again. More, more. He'll feel further emboldened saying, hey, well, this is how they responded last time. Can you imagine where we would be now if the entire leadership in Congress, and if all of the talking heads in the media had excoriated him for abusing his presidential authority, for ignoring the Constitution, for how dare he take our country into an act of war, and calling him the kinds of names I've been called. Can you imagine what kind of pause that would give him before taking another action in Syria, before taking this action in Iran. 
So when you look at this culture in Washington, unfortunately, it has become a culture of warmongers. And those who celebrate war, those who are very cozy with other countries' interests like Saudi Arabia, those who are uh, you know, going to dinners paid for by the military industrial complex, and how insular this environment is, ignoring the cost and the consequence of those decisions, and who pays the price for war. Larry, could I uh, just very briefly um, um, add on to what you just said, Tulsi, about who pays the price? And why is, why is there a price even being paid? Members of Congress are lied to all the time. When I started in Congress, I, you know, one of the first things, you sign a piece of paper that says um, you will not divulge any classified information. It's actually, you know, once you, and you, the only way you get into a, a meeting, a classified meeting, is to sign that. At the beginning of every Congress, you have to sign that. And so I did that the first Congress. I signed it, the first Congress I was in. And of course, you go to the classified meetings, and they lie to you. But you can't talk about how they lie to you because you're breaking the oath that you took that you won't divulge anything that was said in the meeting. So then the, the administration will leak a characterization of the meeting. And you can't refute it because uh, you, can, you can take a stand on your own apart from that, but you cannot refer to what was said in that meeting. And this happens all the time. Finally, Tulsi, I stopped. I stopped. I just, myself and I think Congressman McDermott of Washington State were the only two members of Congress who just didn't sign it at the beginning of the Congress because, I mean, why waste time sitting with people who you know are going to lie to you? And, and um, so part of the problem is that uh, the State Department, the Central Intelligence, the Pentagon, uh, the lifers in there who want to push their policy no matter who the president is, they just lie to bring it about. And so you have to be, <clears throat> and this is important for all of us because, you know, we, we kind of depend on our version of reality so that the ground that we're standing on is solid. You know? <laughs> just we know that this is right, you know, this is, this is a, uh, the floor, this is a door, you know, that, that we have some consensual affirmation about reality. But what happens is people are, are reconstructing the social reality and are making us believe that worse is the better reason. And, and when you're a member of Congress, you're not really sure what's right because, because you're being lied to and you know it. So in the State Department, the Pentagon, and the CIA, they're manufacturing consent. It's what you know, Noam Chomsky wrote about years ago. They're manufacturing consent, and they're doing it with lies. And, and, and to show you, this isn't just about one administration. I go, again, it's about a structure. This is what happened uh, at you know, November, or January uh, the 2nd, when uh, General Soleimani was assassinated. They're still making up the reasons. They're, the it's lies changing are becoming, every day, right? Right. The lies are becoming transparent. How many people in this audience heard of General Soleimani be, you know, before January 2nd? Anybody? Okay, great. Well, I'd say most Americans, it's a good reflection. I'd say America's reflected in this room because most people in America never heard of him. But this is where we're at, and we're getting lied to. Okay, so we, we want to make sure we get some time for questions from the audience. The questions have to be focused on the topic of what we're talking about because we want to make sure we stay focused on this topic. So we have some mic runners. Um, why don't we start right here? Look to your right. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, on 12 September 2006, there was an attack on the United States Embassy in Damascus, Syria. The Syrian cops repelled the attack. White House spokesman Tony Snow issued a statement praising them for doing a good job. And the, United, the Syrian embassy in Washington, D.C. issued a reply saying that uh, it's the United States actions in Iraq, Lebanon, and the Palestinian territories that are fueling, that are inciting a rise in violent uh, Muslim, violent Islamic jihadism. Oh, but. What do they know about the Middle East? Um, they, I, they know a thing or two about what they're talking about. I posed this question, by the way, at a candidate uh, meeting on 21 December of 
2015 to Chris Christie, and you can see his reply uh, on YouTube. What are you going to do to discontinue the provocations that are fueling the rise of uh, violent Islamic jihadism? I think pointing out very directly how our longstanding policy of waging regime change wars uh, is directly connected to opening up uh, the growth for these terrorist uh, organizations like ISIS and Al Qaeda is very critical. I think oftentimes we have leaders in Washington and in the media for that matter who conflate uh, regime change wars with the war against terrorist groups like Al Qaeda as though they're all just one and the same thing. Uh, I think this is what happens when you hear the term, well, I'm against endless war, just wrapping it all up into one thing, but really, they're not the same. They're not the same. And it is uh, truly heartbreaking that we've seen our leaders for so long take this terrorist attack on our country, on 9-11, by this terrorist group, Al-Qaeda, and use that as an excuse to go and topple dictators that they don't like to go and, and try to rebuild the countries that are destroyed in the process and to spend trillions of our taxpayer dollars doing so and the countless lives that are lost in the process, uh, but never ever admitting or acknowledging that it is those very wars that are actually creating that ground and that opening for these terrorists and jihadist groups like Al-Qaeda and ISIS uh, to take advantage of. So what do we do? Let's fix this broken process and these regime change wars and stop creating this situation that actually strengthens these terrorist organizations. Frankly, like we're seeing play out right now. It was right after uh, Trump's taking out of Soleimani that our US commander in Iraq made a public announcement that our troops in Iraq whose mission there was to prevent a deterrence of, of Al Qaeda and ISIS could no longer perform that mission at all. That every one of our soul, every one of our troops deployed to Iraq must now redirect their resources, their time and efforts toward defending against uh, an Iranian threat or, or Iranian-backed Shia militia in Iraq. Therefore, leaving the door wide open once again for these terrorist groups to be able to reconstitute themselves and mount a resurgence. So this goes back to the question that I asked originally. Are our policies and the decisions being made by our leaders strengthening our national security or undermining it? And very clearly the answer is, for so long, it is continuing to undermine our national security. Where Al-Qaeda is stronger today across the region, the Middle East, now than they were when they attacked us on 9-11. Uh, question right here. Uh, Talking about unintended consequences, and we knocked off Saddam Hussein, who was indeed a terrible person. Yeah. We took away the one counterweight to Iran, so we find ourselves in a position, I suppose, of being a counterweight to Iran, and that really is a good example. Now, we I, I don't want to get off the topic, Please. but if you look at China and Russia, and even sub-Saharan Africa, which nobody pays any attention to, what are your views about how we deal with those places to avoid getting in the kinds of wars that we are involved in in the Middle East? Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to comment on this, and I want to ask uh, uh, Stephen to, to weigh in as well. But, but your point is a good one. When, when you hear the national security interests often talked about on television these days, they talk about their concern for the growing influence of Iran in places like Iraq and Syria, but failing to acknowledge that prior to our going to war in Iraq and taking out Saddam Hussein, Iran had basically no presence or influence in Iraq, period. And it was in the aftermath of, of our war being waged there that Iran completely um, wove itself into the government of Iraq uh, and the governance of Iraq in, in so many ways. And the same can be said uh, for Syria. Uh, Syria has leaned into a much stronger relationship with Iran than they ever had before since that war, that regime change war began so long ago. Um, Look, I think that it's important as we look to different regions of the world, whether it's in Africa or across the Middle East or in Eastern Europe or even in Asia, that we really make our decisions based on our national security interests and on building partnerships, building alliances, being able to work with countries like Russia and China 
using diplomacy to be able to work out our differences uh, and also pursue areas of shared and common interest so that it does not have to be a perpetual us versus them zero sum mentality uh, that we've seen taken in our foreign policy for a long time that well we have to keep de troops deployed everywhere in the world because if we don't someone else is going to come in I was in Iraq as a correspondent when Saddam was in power. The Saddam rule was a real dictatorship, not like Iran or Syria. It was a very tough dictatorship. Saddam absolutely crushed even the hints of any kind of religious extremism. If you were sitting in a cafe and told your friend, I don't think there's enough religious influence in our government, it should be more pious, you'd probably be arrested before you got home. Uh, that's not the kind of system we might endorse, but there was no, no danger of any kind of religious extremism emerging in Iraq while Saddam was in power. Um, Saddam also constituted the counterbalance to Iran in the Middle East. That was the perfect basis. We, I, it's very important to understand that when Donald Trump came into power, we had no crisis with Iran. He had some tough decisions to make because Obama left him with terrible situations in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, but not with Iran. We had no crisis with Iran. This thing is completely manufactured. Now, I just want to point out, since we mentioned Soleimani, a little bit about the Sunni-Shia balance in that part of the world. You all know that the Shia world is centered in Iran, and the other major Shia majority country, it's Iraq. So, Iran has a vital interest more even than we do, in crushing ISIS and Al-Qaeda-related groups because a fundamental principle of those groups is kill every Shia. So that certainly gives Iran a certain reason to want to fight Shia, that, those kinds of currents in Iraq and in Syria. That's why Soleimani was a great hero in Iran. He is the greatest ISIS killer of all time. But, as you just heard, we've focused away from ISIS. We're actually not fighting against ISIS anymore. The way to crush terrorism in the Middle East is to build up strong states, strong central governments that control their territories and have armies. We are fighting against that. We don't want strong, stable states because those that are going to emerge are not going to be subservient to our will. A stable Iraq under the government it has now, a stable Iran under the government it has now, a stable Syria under the government it has now would be great tools in fighting radical extremism. But we oppose that because those governments would express the will of their people, and that's not the will that we want them to express. Their crimes are defiance against the United States. And we consider that to be a greater crime than all that ISIS and Al-Qaeda have done to hurt us. So by moving our focus away from the groups that we originally intended to fight, we are showing that we're constantly looking for new excuses and new reasons to build a permanent presence in a place where we try to pretend that we're trying to escape from. This is not sounding good. Do we have more questions here? Um, uh, over on this side, it's a little hard to see. Yep. Yeah. Um, I'd like to get back to the what what structural things can be done, and I'm curious from the panel um, what your views on the War Powers Act are, and if it really is a useful tool for Congress, or whether it's an abdication by Congress of its war-making responsibility. Article One, Section Eight of the Constitution vested the power to uh, make war with Congress. That's that's where it starts. And one could argue whether or not the War Powers Act was even necessary. But since, and Larry, I, you know, I, as a constitutional scholar, you're, you're uh, weighing in on this is critical. But what's happened is that um, we, even though we're told that we have three co-equal branches of government, the, there has been a, a shift, uh, I think maybe more pronounced since Nixon in, 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 uh, towards an imperial presidency. And with that imperial presidency comes the assumption that one can assume the, uh, essentially take over this uh, Article I, Section 8 function. Um, that's, that's more of an academic position. 
But from a political standpoint, I'll say it again, Congress can cut off funds. We, you know, we've been in federal court arguing this Article 1, Section 8. Federal courts have come down to the power of the purse, cut off the funds, done deal. But if Congress goes ahead and funds the wars, it's at a, in a contradictory position of saying we oppose it. So the courts basically are loath to enter into disputes between the branches. But once they, once they do and did on this, on this Article 1, uh, Section 8 question, they said it all comes down to funding. Larry, would you like to add yeah, to I mean, that? There's no doubt that the Constitution vests this power in Congress if Congress had the backbone to exercise it. And that's the key problem. And it's a problem not so much because of Congress in the abstract, but because of political parties in Congress that will never want to stand up against their own president when their own president wants to do something. So the framers imagine Congress being a check on the president, but the political parties have completely destroyed the possibility of Congress being a real check unless Congress is one party and the president is a different party. But right now we don't have that, so we don't have a Congress willing to exert their constitutional authority, which means we have an ever-increasing authoritarian president because of the failure of Congress. I don't know, but I think that's why your point, Stephen, about one change that would radically change yeah. the way this dynamic works is a president who's finally willing to concede the power that the Constitution gives Congress. Yeah. Um, speaking of you know, one Congress being, uh, Congress being in the party of power and aligned with the presidency and turning a blind eye when it's their own president who's doing these things uh, is something that I think we've seen for a long time now. Uh, specific to Iran, in 2018, when Republicans were still in control of the House of Representatives, uh, in that year's defense authorization bill, came to the House floor. I've served on the Armed Services Committee. Uh, that bill passed the committee, and somewhere between passage and getting to the House floor, there was a, pr a provision that was snuck in the bill that was three pages long and essentially gave the administration a blank check to go to war with Iran. The first lines of this provision read, um, we authorize the Secretary of State and Secretary of Defense to develop and implement a counter-Iran strategy. Develop and implement. And it went on to list three pages worth of different things that they could use, tools that they could use to be able to do that, which included military action. And there was no provision in there that said, you must come back to Congress for authorization before implementation. Nothing of the sort. This shocked me that this made its way into the bill and nobody seemed to know about it. Nobody was certainly talking about it. So I introduced an amendment on the House floor as that bill was coming for a full vote, simply stripping this provision from the bill, saying whether you agree or disagree with this language, we must have this debate in Congress as per the Constitution. You don't just give a blank check to this administration or any administration that you get to develop and implement your own war without coming to Congress. Very simple argument based on our Constitution. That, bill, that, that amendment came to the floor for a vote. 60 members of Congress voted for it. The rest voted against. I believe it was 53 Democrats and seven Republicans. 60 members of Congress voted to uphold the Constitution, while the rest said, meh, doesn't matter. So when you talk about Congress abdicating its role and responsibilities that uh, the Constitution provides, that's one example. Fast forward to this, or this fiscal year, 2019, as we finished that year's defense authorization bill, in committee we were able to get a provision in that said, the administration will not take military action against Iran without congressional authorization. Simple line. It was included in the bill that passed the House. Somewhere between the House and the Senate and the conference committee, it came back in that final version. That and many other provisions that were really about upholding co congressional constitutional authorities, gone. You know, if I, if I may, Tulsi, uh, just to add something onto that question, and, and reflecting on what Larry said about how uh, in Congress uh, the president's party will generally uh, support him. It doesn't follow, though, that the opposition party will oppose him at a critical point. Because, give you an example, 
Uh, I stood on the floor of the House for four and a half hours delivering 35 articles of impeachment uh, against President Bush for essentially a whole train of lies that took us into war in Iraq. But the Democratic leaders tabled it. They didn't want to go there. And again, they were voting to fund the war as well. So, you know, keep in mind that, uh, that when you get to these questions of war, and as Tulsi points out, you know, who's making the money? You, you know, what's that structure in there that profits from that? You know, there's a point at which uh, the parties are holding hands, and, and that is a problem. Right here in the front. Give me the control of the money supply, and I don't need politicians and armies said one who Lincoln described as one of the respectable scoundrels. Give me the control of the money supply, and I don't need politicians and armies, both of all of whom need to be paid. What we're talking about is vital, but we all know it. <clears throat> if we want to go to the heart of the matter, which is who controls the pur purse strings and how that spell can be lifted, I brought to you from Bretton Woods and from Concord, Massachusetts, Tulsi, and to my old friend Dennis, the Concord Resolution in the hopes that con folks in Concord, New Hampshire can join us in firing a shot heard around the world in the hopes that on 2020, July 20th, 2020, at the end of the 75th anniversary of Bretton Woods, you, Tulsi, will join us, and Dennis, you'll come back and a warm welcome, Larry, and friends, the Concord Resolution is a fruit of 35 years of work from one whose great-grandfather was one of the central actors in one of the central dramas of our age, which was the passage of the Federal Reserve Act, John Wingate Weeks. The Concord Resolution refers to the Black's Law Dictionary, which is a major source. It said there's no clear, consistent, non-contradictory definition of money. What that means is every contract that we have, be it a loan, car loan, a student loan, a mortgage, a financial contract, if the definition, the terms of the contract aren't clear, the contract is invalid, in effect illegal. The Concord Resolution out of 35 years, working with someone who may prove to be the one who brought to us blockchain in Bitcoin, who goes by this Japanese name that but no one knows really who he is, addresses this issue. And that is until we define money, and this is in a very simple, harmless way that doesn't point fingers at anybody, but says we need to really look at the root of the issue. I could say more, I won't, there are others here, but I brought a copy for you, Tulsi, and as I said, for Dennis. I hope you'll join us on July 20th. And in Concord, Dennis, I commend it to you. Thank you. So I think we might have time for one more question. Is that where we are? So let me see if we have, um, uh, there's a nice mix of men and women here, but I don't see any women questions there. right here. There's one right here. All right. Sorry, I have to juggle glasses. All right, um, I believe it was Mr. Kinzer that spoke about oil and the original takeover of the area in 1953 was the control of oil. Okay, so uh, contention here would be, what would be your plan? You were talking about resources, you know. Um, what would your plan be developing new sources of energy so that we can get the heck out of there and it's not valuable to us? I've wondered, you know, how do we fight the oil companies? How do we find those, what we have, use what we have? Thank you. Thank you. This is a really important question, and I think it really leads to your work, uh, Larry, in getting out this big corporate special interest money that's so corrupting our politics and the decisions that policymakers are making. And that really goes to the heart of what you're talking about here is when we look at the resources that we have in this country, we have no need to be reliant on energy resources from other countries. That's a fact. Um, Yet we are still spending uh, nearly $30 billion on um, energy resources of the past, fossil fuel industry, rather than looking at how we can best use our taxpayer dollars 
towards investing in the clean renewable energy futures of today and tomorrow, really ushering in a true 21st uh, clean renewable energy economy, one that creates good paying jobs, one that provides our country with energy security, where we're not having to be reliant or concerned about uh, which Middle Eastern country is unstable or what's happening on the other side of the world. And it's proven to also be able to bring down the cost of energy, making it more affordable uh, and cost effective for all of us. Redirecting those resources towards investing in that way, I think, is at the heart of how we begin to shift our entire mindset of how we view energy uh, in America today. I don't know if you want to add to that from the... Uh... Well, it's about the freedom of Congress to do the right thing. And so long as there's this endless money, both from lobbyists in the energy industry, but in the military industry as well, driving Congress to do the things that it does, it won't do anything different. So you've got to liberate Congress first from this dependency on this kind of money if you're going to give them a chance to do the right thing. That takes leadership. It takes leadership both in the corruption space but also in the military space, which is why what you're doing here is so important. Dennis, we're almost out of time. Why don't you uh, I'll, I'll, uh, just want to address what I think is you know, a critical question that needs to be raised in every forum that's going on in the country right now, and that is, how do we transition away from oil? Uh, how can we have a regenerative approach towards um, agriculture, a restorative approach towards the land, be able to restore the soil, to be able to um, protect our water resources? Um, you know, right now people are working on things like green jet fuel that provides less of the carbon pollution that conventional jet fuel does. Uh, there's people who have uh, researched and are developing programs to use uh, alcohol from waste that can move us away from using uh, oil. And I think uh, all over the world, people are aware that as atmospheric carbon levels rise, we are losing this effort to try to change our course. And, uh, and we're seeing here in America how this, uh, uh, the, the uh, our, our own addiction oil, our uh, unwillingness to chart a new path is endangering us. I mean, when you had almost, what, 80 degrees in Concord the other, way, other day? How's that happen? Is there not an effect on the climate from human behavior? And so, you know, we, we need these debates right now in this, in this presidential forum. And because what are we going to do? Are we going to take a new direction? Are we going to uh, keep insisting that somehow we can keep on this path of, of addiction to oil and with no consequences? Stephen, you want to give some final words? I just wanted to add one point. So in 1980, President Carter, pushed by his national security advisor, Mr. Brzezinski, pronounced what became known as the Carter Doctrine. It has to do with the Persian Gulf. That was when we identified the Persian Gulf as an area of extraordinary national security importance to the United States that we would defend even militarily if necessary. We did that for two reasons. Number one, to keep the Soviet Union out of the Persian Gulf region, and number two, to protect vital supplies of energy that we needed. Today, there is no Soviet Union, and we don't get our vital supplies of energy from the Persian Gulf. So the reasons that we identified the Persian Gulf as essential to our security have evaporated, but yet we're continuing to crowd the Persian Gulf with warships, essentially hoping to spark some kind of an incident. We don't need to be there anymore, and transitioning to another kind of energy future is another reason why we can pull ourselves out of that part of the world where our presence only undermines our own security while weakening the stability of the countries we claim to be protecting. Tulsi. Wow. Um, thank you. This comes down to leadership. This is really the question before all of you as voters, as you head towards election day here in New Hampshire on February 11th, understanding the responsibility that you have not only as individual voters to cast your vote, but what kind of message you will send to the nation as a first in the nation state. And I think very clearly laid out this evening is the importance of that role and responsibility that the commander in chief has and how necessary it is that we have a commander in chief who exercises foresight, who has experience and understanding in these areas of national security and foreign policy, 
who's able to look to these decisions that have made throughout our nation's history and has seen how those decisions have actually undermined the interests of Americans all across this country and have undermined our own national security interests. Uh, I'm grateful to be able to be here and to share this stage with these gentlemen, to be able to bring these issues to the forefront before you make this decision and offer to you that I bring that experience, yes, serving as a soldier for almost 17 years, of being deployed to the Middle East twice, of understanding very clearly the cost and the consequences of these decisions, both on human lives, on our taxpayer dollars, these resources that still today, as we are sitting here, We'll be in this room for about two hours by the time we walk out the door. In those two hours that we are here, we will have seen $11 million go to Afghanistan alone. $11 million in just two hours that we're gathered here tonight going to prop up a corrupt government in Afghanistan and line the pockets of big defense contractors and consultants with nobody understanding the answer to the question, for what? What are we trying to accomplish? What does quote unquote victory look like? How long will we have to keep doing this? How much longer will we see more and more lives lost? How much longer will we see our hard earned taxpayer dollars being taken out of our schools, being taken out of our rural community health centers, being taken out of our ability to really serve the very urgent and pressing needs of people and communities all across this country. The experience that I've had in Congress now for seven going on eight years has given me a depth and understanding really truly of the cost and consequences of these decisions, understanding our Constitution and the role that Congress and the President has to make that have prepared me to walk in on day one to fulfill that responsibility to serve you to serve our country as commander in chief and to give you the peace of mind that we will end these long-standing regime change wars, the follow-on nation-building missions that, that happen, work to end this new Cold War that we're in with ratcheting up tensions between the United States and nuclear armed countries like Russia and China, end this nuclear arms race that's making the world less safe taking more money out of our pockets, and instead redirect those dollars and those resources really towards serving the urgent and pressing needs that we have right here at home. Thank you so much for your time this evening, and thanks to my colleagues here for joining us. So, I, I want to thank Stephen and Dennis Kucinich and Tulsi Gabbard. Um, you know, I teach in a university, and it's astonishing to think I look at my students and recognize none of them have lived in America that has not been at war. For their whole life, we have been at war. And so I think New Hampshire has understood the problems of money and politics for a long time. But if you could begin to speak to the problems of money driving us to perpetual war, the rest of America would begin to hear it. So I'm grateful for what you've done, and I'm grateful for this event tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to form a picture line coming up from the left.
might find their way into my dreams tonight But I know that they'll be gone When the morning light sings or brings new things But tomorrow night you see That they'll be gone too The things I have to do But if all of these dreams might find their way into my day to day I'd be under the impression I was somewhere in between With only two just me and you Not so many things we got to do Places we got